Thank you so very much, Phil, for the lovely things you said about me. And thank you so very much to you and also to Marcia for inviting me. Y'all are amazing people. You're amazing poets, and I'm just super lucky to know you. I also am extraordinarily grateful to both of my poetry teachers, one of whom is David St. John, who is also my USC colleague and mentor, an amazing teacher, and Dorothy Barisi, who also is just a fabulous teacher. All of their students are just the most remarkable poets. Some of those folks are here tonight. I am very grateful to see y'all. Um, before I um, introduce some of the characters in the Making Sex School, I want to read um, for my introduction. When I first imagined the women of the Macon Sex School, the sway of kind-hearted, brilliant, gorgeous, and incomparable girls and women absolutely enthralled me. Their lives, their adventures proved to be dense with courtesies, excitement, human and humane emotional innovation. Once authoritarian government intensified in this country, my daily experiences of writing these poetic fictions took on a different task. As encroaching fascism undermined the beloved natural home where all of us live, and my personal and my professional lives were characterized by the glories and the misunderstandings of my engagement with the Latin American poor, the women of the Make Sex School emerged as a space of metaphysical, physical, spiritual and literary resistance and also as a refuge. There at the sex, the Macon sex against a musical backdrop whose chords echo the women's strength, persistence, ingenuity, beauty and generosity, the sex school teachers and students provide a courageous world informed by tenderness. And I need to also say that this um, portrait collection, like my last one, is very highly populated. And so in both of these collections, um, both um, um, my previous one, which is Glass Piano Piano Class, and this one, which is the Macon Sex School, I have a cast of characters. Let me share some of those characters before I share some of the poems. We have Aurelia. She ripped the cloth of convention. There's Cynthia, the keenest of racial observers. Now Sharona knew the plies and possessed abilities to seize the most satisfying gestures. Sharina was co-founder of the sex school and Sharina was known for, their depth, for the depth of her instincts. And I'm going to share some of the poems I'm going to start with the title poem. It's an earthbound touch. In the sex school, silk prevailed over perfume of the night and kindness, kindred controlled the kitchen. As in the sex school, timidly gracious women, eyes ablaze, coals controlling only comedy, compassion, actual consideration, abiding and prompting man after open man to seek out sympathy so sincere, so supreme, that the woman who owned the sex school, its larder, its lace, recognition that she was right, that grandeur, its challenge, its happy heat, arrived by liquid day, by ocean night, by wonder wild and keen and copious ripening, by surprise so certain, so simple, she wondered then, now, later, why she'd not started teaching talent, teaching tremendous and earthbound touch. It's tenderness, it's taste, far earlier, far sooner, far and away more certainly. One of the things that is true about the Macon Sex School 
is that it possesses this vast geography, both internal and emotional, but also external and very concrete. That is to say, it involves a frozen food locker. The poem is within a freezer's wild abundance. Because in fact, it was him and me who found our ways among the frozen food, the locker lacking sapphire night and sudden dawn. Yet there inside that place that otherwise contained the butter beans, the homemade soups, we placed our wanton diary filled with images of trees, with words about the ways we played and splayed our times, filled with crime, a touch of patience. So I say to my students all the time, this is water, not tequila. Um, anyone who spent any time in Macon, Georgia, and especially if they've spent the night there, will hear the sound of the train. The poem is, and did you hear the train, my love? Just walking there and kissing, where we find the backyard tracks and hear that wail of train, of sudden song. The tender throng where treasures hover, shiver near the Queen, Queen Anne's lace. The daisy's colors sense my breath. You strip me down around a Macon south with gesture. Ways you wonder, offer pleasures, light as liquid as your glance. We walk a naked knee, so supple. Another thing that's true about Macon, Georgia is that it's the home of a number of remarkable musicians. Um, one of these remarkable musicians was the late Little Richard. Another was the late great Otis Redding who wrote the remarkable poem, remarkable song, Respect. However, I never met either of them. The only one of these remarkable musicians I ever met was Arthur Conley not from Macon, but Atlanta, but nonetheless, he was one of Otis Redding's protégés. The poem is respect so raw, so real. That time of inkling, that time of grief and open grandeur and perspiration, when Otis appeared and Arthur Conley to ponder if the singing started between the breasts are at the harbor, but not until their sisters sang, did soul, if simmer, if simple sin, arrive, arrive, arrive. I'm going to read a poem that is populated with a number of people. In this poem, we have Sharina, we have Wild Sharona, we have Ilona, um, and we have Lightning, who was one of the narrator's men. The poem is fabricating lips adorned with ruby glass, with hot and high eternal sass, oh, get your muscles on Sharona, get those female muscles on. Sharina from the sex reminded wild Sharona that the world so large and gracious that Ilona who arrived by rain and held the rain to gratitude knew the men had felt a woman's body. Yes, just any woman's body still belonged to all the men who pounced. And she, Ilona said to me, I needed to remember all the other women there whose inner utter muscles grew as mine still do. Within my chamber where I played with lightning, yes, my man, my unsaid man, 
to gasp each time another person tried to seize my gar garnets or my rubies that I used and crushed and made into a sort of lethal lipstick filled with glass in its entirety. But then again, I wore the skin of grandeur and of all us women still retaining powers and the destinies to sing, to bring the broken men within the fold and there and then, as though they were of clay remade, I welcomed them within my school for sex, and there revealed us women's keen and sometimes kindly reflexes that no man had ever had to hot or cold create, disseminate. Um, The untitled poem I'm going to read has two characters. One of the characters name is Carmen, who finds her way into many of my poems. Um, and the other character is Octavio Paz, the late great Mexican poet about whom, as some of y'all know, I'm writing another book. The day of chance when Carmen found a place, a field, a sometimes scent, Gardenia's reigning near enough to gather for the church that was. She claimed the night, the life, the time, invited pies inside and shimmered, gathered time and space and clamor, asked him if he'd like to dance the world she'd seized, the right display. Gardenia's in the night, her hair, the poet reddened as though he sensed the woman plundered thoughts untold and sang the light, the night, the pleasures, opened worlds he never knew, containing verse he couldn't write. Making time, I dance the ground and sing its song. I make the pie, the sky, belong to other sounds and other seas. The ways I weigh the night I make right here with you who comes along and feeds on me and sings my song. And then again, we Chatter all the habits there, the rules that women never matter there. We scatter ocean, slather portions, filled with care and bright concern to change the world, to rearrange our pattern there. Um, the poem I'm going to read next is in memory of the great Colombian writer, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, who I so hope, wherever he is, is hearing me say that I teach his remarkable novel, A Hundred Years of Solitude, every single semester at the University of Southern California. The poem is, whose life in this room has been touched by wild demands for kindness, Oh, she brought the oldest prayers of chocolate, a recipe from Shashila's great and sainted neighbor. Yes, the black emboldened Jew who lived, reproved, removed the stolen emeralds from a field of crooked pirates who had settled oh so sweetly in the silken laundry coven where a bold and brazen gemstone bed, the glimpse, the glimmer, almost read as though the pirates too remembered just how eager, eagerly, oh, how easily they blushed. In memory of Gabo, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Um, 
people who know me even, even slightly know that purple it be my favorite color. The poem is when backyard plums, they congregate. I made a school for sex where all the colors, all the hues, a display of fruit and taste of happiness could congregate. A world of orchestra and lightning, like the times in bed. Remember, Ben, just how you pushed, you licked, you never quit until you saw my body turn to lightning blaze, a kind of glance, an open wild in bedroom chants, I bartered as I heard its inner unsung orchestra. You chanted out my inner notes, the ways, the realms of song, an open biscuit I remembered there and then, the ways my man had longed for fire because I made a wild reserve. O oh, peach field dance, O oh, nectarine, O oh, southern backfields plum. And say again, you said it then, the ways that food and breasts, that fields ablaze, just like the lightning trees express. One of the things that's true about Macon, Georgia is that it's landlocked. Um, it makes a person long for water. Um, and the poem I'm going to read has some characters in it, including Felipe, um, Ramon Ramon, um, Wild Sharona, Carmona. Um, and there's also a Spanish language word in this poem, which is nadie, which means nobody. The water wailed, it widened there when women calm and keen with luster on the wanton wild calamitous. No one asked, no Nadia inquired, oh, where and is the river close, the ocean near enough? This bedroom blaze amazes as Felipe pointed out and then Ramon Ramon who thought he'd handled wild Sharona, redefined Carmona, no. The men who never ever swam the raw, the radiant, and somehow calming creek of feeling, oh so fanciful, oh so somehow fabulous, each time a man, another, recognized how abundant were we women because we owned the sounds and when we breathed the water wailed and wondered when we wander in again, again, and once again to sing. Um, thank y'all so very much for being here. I'm going to read one more poem, um, but again, I'm just super grateful to all of y'all for spending the time. The poem is, when it felt so right forever, open plum, abiding. After the sex food paused, all making its song, its tune, its prey, remembered how she found the land, the longing for the plot, the central comely castle painted ripe and wet and violet that remembered too her sound, her brew of suddenness, how easily the men had entered night, how night became a satin road, a sudden slip, an open map to see. The seasoned succulence, the ways the school taught tenderness, the ways Shashila missed, remembered men in fact could learn, would turn when she a mind, when she a seer spelled and sang and sold the map and held the notes, the flesh, the worlds they'd come to her to feel. Thank you.